Today we're looking at the 24th slide. And this slide is a mind map. A mind map is a way of looking at ideas, projects, presentations, conferences, and I'll put a link to my slide shares below and you can look at mind maps. So this mind map is called Our Really Big Problems Mind Map by David Lipschitz, that's me. I created most of it on the 21st of April, but today I've spent a couple of hours updating it and looking through it. And I'm gonna start with it closed and then I'm gonna open one level at a time. So let's open the first level. The first level you can see that I'm gonna be talking about electricity. That's number one. I'm gonna talk about water. I'm gonna talk about food, education, transport, jobs, health. I'm gonna say, what is the main point we need to look at and so what? So let's start on the left here with electricity. We're going to open at one level and see what we get. So worldwide, even with energy efficiency and all the things we're doing, energy efficient fridges, energy efficient pool pumps, energy efficient motors, variable speed drives, which means when you start, when you start a normal motor, let's suppose the motor needs 5 kilowatts, then sometimes you need 15 kilowatts, even 20 kilowatts to start the motor because the motor draws a lot. And if you need a much bigger inverter or a much bigger power station or a much bigger generator to make that that uh, um, engine start, that generator start, whatever it is that you're starting. So you need when you start that engine or that motor, you need a lot of power to make it start. So, but if you use a variable speed drive, which slowly got, you hear that kind of noise as it increases, then you need much smaller inverter. And therefore you, you can save money on your inverter, you can save money on the size of your power station by changing the kind of equipment that's in that system. But even with that, worldwide, there's 3.6% growth in energy every year. You can't actually see this mouse, um, which is unfortunate, but okay. Um, but you can see that this is highlighted right now. So um, <clears throat> you can see there's 3.6% growth means that in South Africa, we had 40 gigawatts 20 years ago, and in 20 years, it should have become 80 gigawatts. But in actual fact, it went from 40 gigawatts to 28 gigawatts. And in South Africa, we have load shedding when we get to 28 gigawatts. And considering that the population of South Africa has doubled in the past 20 years, we should have 160 gigawatts. And then if you take account of the amount of coal and all the other minerals and elements and so on that we export, then my personal opinion is that South Africa should have 320 gigawatts. So even if ESCOM could actually build 10 gigawatts, they've been trying to add 10 gigawatts for the past over 12, maybe 12 years, 13 years, and they haven't finished that yet. So even if we said ESCOM, go wild, build as much as you want, there's no way they can get to 320 gigawatts. So there's a huge amount of possibility. I've said you double doubling population, 80 gigawatts to 160 gigawatts. ESCOM needs to be the grid owner or someone else will do it. Millions of people in their garages, for example. ESCOM doesn't need to understand, ESCOM doesn't understand the importance of power stations, isn't in the number of people who build and maintain them, but in the number who have livelihood because of them. So ESCOM, let's suppose ESCOM have got 50,000 people working for them, and then they go build a power station and needs 18,000 people to build the power station. That's very nice, and that employs people, and that's great. But ESCOM are fixed, and the government, the South African government, are fixated on how many people can be employed building power stations. But if, if we had another 10 gigawatts on the grid, that would probably equate to another 2 million jobs, maybe even 3 million. So all this, this South Africa's unemployment is getting worse and worse. And part of the reason is because electricity is getting more expensive. And at the same time, it's getting more expensive, it's getting less. And its environmental quality is getting worse. And so when you've looked at all the other sides, you can see that electricity is a big problem. Electricity is not just a big problem in South Africa. When you look at Australia, you look at Europe, you look at America, there's a book called The Grid by Gretchen Becker, which explains how the American grid is falling apart because capital has not been in, reinvested in the grid. If you build a power station and the power station is going to last 40 years, then for the first 25 years, it makes a loss. And then for the last 15 years, it makes a big profit. Now, some of that profit needs to be plowed back into building the new generation of power stations, but that hasn't been happening. And the same with the roads network, road network, the rail network, all other networks, they all need expansion. The place where people are putting their money at the moment is in electronic infrastructure, fiber, backbone, 
cable, etc. Satellites, and that's all very nice, but all of that depends on electricity. If we don't get the electricity right, all of that stuff's going to fall apart. And that's the first really big problem set called electricity. The second really big problem is water. So in South Africa, we have, a, in Cape Town, for example, we have a drought area. We, we've known since 1800 when Cape Town had its first drought, which was actually a water management crisis, that, so that Cape Town needed water and needs water. And even when the dams are full, we still have water rationing and we still have very high prices. But if we, we can desalinate water for about 10 rand a, a kiloliter, but we're paying 45 rand a kiloliter. That's what I'm paying for my water. So if the, if the government would get the act in gear and allow private people to build desalination plants or they do it themselves, they could actually bring down the water cost and increase water production. And if you look at a well-run city, a well-run city allows its people to use 400 liters of water a day. And maybe you just think that sounds a lot, especially if you live in a hut off grid. But we live in a city. We've got waterborne sewage. We've got all kinds of things we need to run. And we need a lot of electricity. We need a lot of water. It needs to be abundant. It needs to be clean. It needs to be cheap. All the things I've been speaking about. Next thing, crisis, is food. We know that prices are rocketing. I mean, I, I wrote this initially in 2018. I haven't modified it. Prices were already rocketing in 2018. And then we've had two years of lockdowns. And that's caused massive supply chain blockages. You know, it's like having a heart attack. The world has had a heart attack for two years. And because of that heart attack, arteries are clogged and transport can't happen the way it used to happen. And so prices are rocketing whilst shortages are increasing. And yet today we can grow food in buildings locally. In fact, I know a few buildings around Cape Town where they're growing food. I've seen more greenhouses recently that where food production can go up and prices can come down. But we mustn't be pricing our food and our water and electricity in terms of global pricing. 30% of Cape Town's fuel comes from coal. And that price didn't go up when the worldwide oil price went up. But oil is priced in dollars and the coal is priced in dollars, unfortunately, even though a third of South Africa's oil is coming from coal. So we have a food crisis. We have an education crisis. The third world population is exploding. The world's ability to educate these people using the current paradigm is decreasing. So you think about it. The Industrial Revolution required people to go to university, sorry, go to school for 12 years, then go to university for four to six years, then start working as an apprentice, then work as an apprentice for a few years until you became the professional, the subject matter expert, the SME, who could build the bridge or whatever. And so when someone built a bridge, a two-lane or a three or four-lane bridge in each direction, if suddenly five years later a truck that had never been built before went over the bridge, the bridge didn't collapse. But yet we see in other systems things collapsing. And that's because there's a lot of MOOCs, which is these multiple online university type courses where you can go to Udemy and Coursera and uh, a lot of other places where you can do online courses. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we need to understand that if someone's got a three-month course in a specific programming language, that's what they have. If you have a three-month course in electricity, that's what they have. If you have a three-month course in water or food, whatever, compared to someone who's got, say, school, 12 years three to four years at university full-time, maybe an apprenticeship for three years, etc. Apprenticeships today are called interns because somehow people decided that apprenticeship, apprentice, an apprenticeship should be outlawed. And so now we have interns. The world's, But now, as we know, the world's, uh, the amount of information is doubling every year in the world. So you start a four-year degree, and then in four years' time, potentially half your degree is out of date. But if you look at IT, we started with a mainframe, then we went to client server. Now we're back at the mainframe, which we call the cloud. And my prediction is that within the next three to five years, we're going to go back to client server. Because, I mean, you look at your desk. You've got a super powerful computer on your desk. And maybe if you're doing everything in the cloud, maybe you're not even using the power on your desk. So my belief is there is going to be much more interaction. People are going willy-nilly, putting as much stuff as they can in the cloud. But that's the mainframe. And the people that owned the mainframes in the past, they put up prices too fast. And people went to client server. And I believe that that's, that's going to happen again. CD, you know, SSDs are very cheap. Memory is very cheap. Hardware is really cheap. And so that's, that's going to happen. But the, if we look at education, third world population is exploding. And if you look at Africa, 
let's we look i think we spoke about this so if you build a if you build a coal power station you need to have electrical engineers 12 years school four years university maybe even doctorates maybe even 10 years university 10 years of 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 work okay millions maybe 5 10 20 million each investment you need electrical engineers civil engineers mechanical engineers industrial engineers you need scientists you need all kinds of people involved in the supply chain. You need coal miners. You need oil miners. You need all these things. And yet, if you put in a renewable energy system with solar panels or wind turbines, you can train a person with a matric who's got maths and science in a year to be the person that certifies that system or in three months to install that system. So renewable energy lends itself to the third world. And once we have an abundance of electricity and we have a knowledge, we can have an abundance of water. And once we have an abundance of water, we can have an abundance of food. And we can build the system that allows us to change the paradigm to where we want it to be. So I've said, even with MOOCs, we still have a major crisis and the ability, the opportunity is to find a way to educate people without them needing to be literate. Writing and reading are relatively new features in our lives, only 6,000 years old. And that's why the Old Testament says that the world is only 6,000 years old. So Adam and Eve arrived, and that's when writing started. But the world is billions of years old. We all know that. Okay? And the reason that the Torah says that the, the Old Testament says the world is 5,700, 5, 5,800 years old is that's when writing started. But the thing is, I'm not saying that we shouldn't learn to read and write. We do need to read and write, and we need to do arithmetic. And my... My, my three questions I ask everybody is, what's the VAT rate? What is the VAT rate? Value added tax. In South Africa, it's 15%. My next question is, what is 15% of 100? What is 15% of 100? And my next question is, what is a half plus a quarter? And even people who've done mathematics at high school or even you know, people doing science or engineering, sometimes they need to think about that answer. So education is a crisis. We've got a lot of people who need to be educated. We've got a major crisis in electricity, water, food. We're going to get to transport now and other systems that are failing. We need to find a way of dealing with all these without having to put someone through 20 years of education. We do need schooling because, in my opinion, what schooling does is it teaches you to use your brain. Everybody gets born with the same brain. We need to be taught for about five or 10 years how to use the brain. That's So we maybe have from 0 to 13, you have play. You have learning languages, you have family, you have relationships, you have learning econo economics, you have learning all that kind of basic stuff. Then you have five years of school where you learn things that interest you. By then you should know what interests you. And then you can have university where you delve into, you know, science and engineering and accounting and finance and economics and literature and so much, so much possibility. Transport. A massive disruption is on the cards with electric vehicles and driverless technology being ubiquitous within 20 years. Petrol stations and their tenants, America call them gas stations. In Europe, a tenants are already gone and taxi and bus drivers will be a thing of the past. So I've got friends who run taxis in South Africa and I say to them, You're, you shouldn't be investing in second, third hand retirement funds. You should be creating your own retirement fund and buying your own driverless technology so that that hundreds of people that are driving your taxis can sit at home while the taxis do the work. And the people think I'm mad when I say this, but the point about it is that it's possible. And the, and it, and the people that own the system should run the system. If you work in a call center, then you know that your call center is being automated with bots and all kinds of things. The call center people should own the call centers. The taxi drivers should own the taxis. The, 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 the taxi drivers the taxi owner should own those systems with the taxi drivers, and all of the systems should be like that. Whatever system we work in, people should own the system. I know how to do that. Speak to me. Let's talk. The sixth thing is jobs. <clears throat> all jobs are at risk, and then there's tax. So what happens when you have employment? Employees pay tax. What happens if jobs go down? What happens if automation means that jobs go down, tax goes down? If tax goes down, investment in infrastructure goes down, and therefore we end up with crises like transport, electricity, water, food, all these prices rocketing, inflation rocketing. Why? Because tax, tax collection is going down, and therefore infrastructure investment is going down. Let's see what I wrote about tax over here. 
Tax depends on jobs and profits. So companies need to make profits. So yes, companies are making high profits because they've got fewer people. But are those companies paying the profits to the taxman or are they hiding the profits? We know that there's all that kind of stuff going on. In a world of exponential growth, and especially exponential growth of free resources, the tax base will decrease dramatically and quickly. So what's been happening in my life, for example, is I can't. I haven't been able to find work. I'm 58 years old. I'm finding it really, really difficult to find work when 25-year-olds are getting the kind of work that I want. They're charging much less than me. Okay, But here's the issue. Sometimes I can do something in two hours that takes them 30 hours to do. So even if that's 30 hours at $50 an hour compared to my rate, $200 an hour, two hours, my rate is still cheaper. And I'm saying to the companies that are involving me and calling me in for emergency when the, when, when, the, when the junior people or the middle people haven't finished on time, I'm saying, well, let me rather work with them for 15 minutes at a time. And therefore, I do less work. They do less work. Everything is beneficial. But the point about it is that with me being unable to find normal work, I'm doing a lot of bartering. So therefore, I'm saying to people, I'll do this for you. You do that for me. Let's suppose you grow potatoes. I can do some work for you. I can mentor you. You've got a restaurant. You, your restaurant, you want to grow your restaurant. I'm mentoring you to grow your restaurant. You give me free lunch. And so there's a barter going on. There's a trade going on. And that trade means there's no tax collection. There's no, everything looks like everybody's unemployed. You go and look at places like the Eastern Cape, which has got massive unemployment. But then again, there's a difference between being poor and being dependent. So a poor person is someone in my book who doesn't pay tax. And a person who's being dependent is a different problem altogether. So people in the Eastern Cape are poor, but they have their own houses, they grow their own food, and so on. So let's look at all this. All jobs at risk. So let's go. Office buildings. So in a, this was in I wrote this in 2018. Okay, let's go and see what I wrote about office buildings. I wrote CBD type office buildings might disappear. What about shopping centers and parking garages? Well, let's say, okay, traffic is already a nightmare. Pod offices and co-working spaces are expanding exponentially. Many people are working from home. So CBD, Central Business District type buildings, they're still being built, like the city of Cape is still building. I don't know why they're building them, but we've just had two years of COVID, two years of lockdowns, two years of lockouts. We've learned how to work from home offices. I don't like to say I work from home. I like to say my office is at my house. I used to have an office in the building. I, have my office. I don't need a car. I don't need to transport myself. I don't have stress associated with transport. I'm never late for meetings. I don't have to travel for the half a day to get to a meeting for half an hour. Sometimes I used to travel for half a day to Johannesburg for a one-hour meeting, and actually maybe the meeting was open 10 minutes. Nowadays, if I meet on Zoom or I meet on StreamYard, which I'm using now today, or I meet on MS Teams, or I meet on a Skype, or I meet on WhatsApp, sometimes the meeting's open five minutes. It's done. We've, we've, and maybe we just spend the five minutes having coffee and discussing some strategy. So we people are complaining about traffic. They're complaining about petrol price increases, gas price increases, transport problems, fuels going up. You know, in the last two years, the price of petrol has doubled. It's even got, by, by, the, by the end of this year, it would have tripled in price. How can people afford to own cars? A part office, which, which we see up here, is a local office. So, for example, a bank. A bank doesn't want its people to work from home necessarily because of security problems where um, if, they had, if people are at home, then maybe there's information that's on their desk or in their computer. And if there's a robbery, it's a problem. But then you can, we've got, we've got offices right nearby. Within, within the 10-minute walk of my house, there's a 20-story building, can easily be converted into offices, and the bank can build a pod office there with high security. People can log in, log out, and the equipment can be there. And I just walk to my office, and if I want to come in for lunch, no problems, only 10 minutes away. People are already working from home. And I wrote CBD type office buildings might disappear, and then they'll be converted into housing. And people from the from townships and so on want to live in the CBD, so there could be a mass migration change where people move out of the city and people other people move into the city. Shopping centers, online shopping is taking over. Online shopping was already taking over before COVID. And then I wrote that... Um, they must amusement arcades must stay where people hang out. So, for example, one of the problems in Cape Town is that our amusement park was shut down. And let me just move this over here so you can see how this works. And parking garages will disappear and possibly become flats. So, again, there's there's that possibility that will happen. Plus, 
if you have an electric car and you drive to a shopping center and it's off peak, you can buy electricity at a cheap rate. And if your car is still there at peak time, you can say to the shopping center, I'll sell you 50% of my battery power. And therefore, the person with a battery powered car can actually be making money while their car is parked as opposed to paying for parking. What about jobs that need to be on site, like electricians, plumbers, doctors, law enforcement, mining? Let's open all this up. So what I've, what I've got here for you. Law enforcement, camera technology will make a lot of law enforcement redundant. So we already know with 5G, with cameras, with microphones all over the place, law enforcement is becoming redundant. So tens of thousands of people working as policemen, as armed response officers, you know, automation means that they're going to lose their jobs. Driverless vehicles mean there'll be driverless vehicles driving around. But how, you'll say, how will someone jump out of the car? I don't know, but people are going to solve the problem. And then driverless vehicles, there's, they never park illegally. You know, they're always licensed, etc. What about electricians? You know, so, you know, you will need to have electricians who come to your house, plumbers and doctors. But, for example, I know a doctor. In fact, I know a GP who lives around the corner from me. She's worked from home for 30 years. I know a maxillofacial surgeon whose office is at their house. I know electricians and plumbers who work from home in terms of that the office is at their house and they do call outs. They don't work in, work in buildings anymore. Mining is being automated. So it's automatic trucks, there's automatic digging machines, there's all kinds of things. And the mine is transported to refineries and power stations. It's all happening on conveyor belts, it's all being automated. Transport jobs. <clears throat> The transport jobs are being automated. Airport luggage handling is being automated. Driverless vehicles are becoming the norm. So what's happening with farming? We see murders almost every day, and farmers are moving into buildings and cities. So yes, some farming needs to happen remotely, and those people are, are protecting themselves in various ways, but a lot of farming is moving into buildings in cities. And then you have off-site jobs such as accountants, and then you've got products like Caseway and DraftWorks, which will allow uh, eventually private people to automatically generate the annual financial statements. And so accountants will lose their jobs. Call center people will lose their jobs. Or they'll work from home. Fiber technology will mean that call center computer programmers. Design patterns will mean that some programming will become simplified, reusable. But as we've seen, the people, there are people that understand how the system fits together and works together. And the programming is becoming more complex. And therefore, there are fewer people earning a lot more because they understand how things fit together. So you can see what's happening. And this is all about jobs and tax and automation and who's going to be automated. What about lawyers? You can add lawyers here. Let's just add, let's go here and say lawyers. So lawyers are going to be automated. There's already a lot of uh, documents you can download from the internet. Uh, you can go to, you can look up law, you can look up cases and um, things that you used to have to go to an office for, talk to your lawyer. There's a lot of uh, template documents that you can get. So for me, what I do is I use the template document, I prepare my document, and then I send it to the lawyer and say, lawyer, I'm giving you half an hour. Please just look through this document because lawyers charge a lot of money. I'm a small uh, independent entrepreneur, been like that for 30 years. And so I can't afford expensive lawyers. So what I do is I try to do as much of the work on, I can, as, as myself as I can and then give, you know, the lawyer the, the bit at the end. And you have written AI, artificial intelligence might run the call center. So that's jobs. After jobs, we get, after six, we get seven. Seven is about garbage. So there's plastic in the ocean. And one garbage truck of plastic is being dumped into the ocean every minute. I mean, what are we doing? We've got landfills. We've got incinerators. We've got reuse and recycling. We've got pharmaceutical waste. I mean, and this, as I said, I wrote this before COVID, but now you're looking at, we've got all this medical waste. I mean, my my when I go to see my dentist, I go see my dentist twice a year. Well, I go see the, the, the lady that cleans my teeth twice a year, and I see my dentist once a year. The cost of the equipment that they use, their gloves, the masks, everything, its I think the price has doubled or tripled in the past two years because they have to wear such thicker gloves. And what's happening with all this plastic? 
Where's it going? Is it being recycled? Would it take 25 million years to recycle? Would it lie in the sea? Would it kill fish? Pharmaceutical waste. And what? not just pharmaceutical waste. What a, from, from, for example, gloves and all the, um, the liquids that we're using. But what about we take a drug, a tablet, and then we, we go to the toilet and we wash it in the water and then it's in the water. And then we drink the water. And we, everybody's getting drugs that other people were, were, were prescribed, but we're all drinking them. How much of that stuff is clean before it comes back to us? Is the cleaning system cleaning all of the chemicals out of our, out of our water? We know that in cities there's 10,000 man-made chemicals in our air. The pollution is high. We have to do detoxes. <clears throat> I added health today. This is new. So there's plagues and pandemics. So in my opinion, nature is sick. She has a respiratory problem. She can't breathe. She sends human a breathing sickness. And if humans ignore this warning, it'll be at our peril. So we've just had a shot across our bow. Most of the people have learned how to work from home. Most people have learned how to react from, interact from home. People that have to go into the office or people that have to go into the factory don't necessarily have to be there all the time. They can work in their home office as much as possible, go into the factory when they need to, or go on site when they need to. I'm not saying people should not be talking to each other. They should still be social, socializing. We should still be going to coffee shops. We should still be meeting each other and hugging and all those things. But how much of that do we need to do in an office? If you have an office building with 5,000 people, I was in the UK in 1990, United Kingdom. There was something called Legionnaire's disease with droplets in the air caused by air conditioning systems not being cleaned. And for me, the latest breathing illness we've had in the last two years is very much like Legionnaire's disease to me. I'm not a doctor, so it's not medical advice. Chronic illness is at an all-time high. People are taking tablets for blood, high blood pressure. Let's go and write some of the things. What do we got? We got high blood pressure. We've got uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. We've got all these things that people are taking pills for. And once they have to take pills, they've got to take the pills the rest of their life. We've got people who have heart attacks. Not heat, heart attacks. Have heart operations. And then they're on tablets the rest of their life. Tablets to prevent the new heart from being ejected, all kinds of things. So these people have got chronic problems and they're taking tablets for the rest of their life. And for me, if the medical system was working properly, Yes, there'd be a short-term time when you've got to take tablets, but over 20 years, you should have to wean yourself off the tablets because you learn how to eat. Sadhguru says the world's biggest chemical factories in the body. I agree with you. And if you, there's cancers. Cancers are at an all-time high. There's all kinds of extra cancers because there's 10,000 chemicals which we're eating and drinking every day. If we're not doing detoxing, it's getting worse. A cancer happens when a cell eats a cell next to it because it's not in an oxygenated environment. That's one cause. Nutrition. Although we, we buy things and we see lists of vitamins and lists of all the chemicals and so on in the food, you know, do we really understand that? Do we understand that maybe I don't need a chocolate today, but I have bread, starch. Starch is sugar. I have milk. Milk is sugar. It's got lactose. I have potatoes. Potatoes is starch is Sugar. I'm getting sugar in lots of different ways. I'm getting all kinds of nutrition in lots of different ways. I'm eating wheat. I'm getting sugar indirectly. Sugar is a big cause of disease. If I want to cut disease, I cut sugar. That's why you hear the doctor will say, or the healer, whatever, will say, stop bread, stop milk, stop wheat. Why are they saying this? Because they're saying stop sugar. They're saying don't make sugar. And sugar makes your body acidic. And if your body is acidic, then it gets sick. Your body needs to be more alkalinic. So alkaline. So we need to be understanding about nutrition. I worked for six months in a hospital in the IT department. And I used to go to the hospital canteen sometimes. But it was horrible. It was really sticky food and chips and pies. And I just thought it's such a big opportunity when people are at hospital for the the patients and the patient's families who go and eat in the canteen, maybe while they're waiting for the operation, or maybe the patient orders some food, that there's a, such a big opportunity for teaching. There's such a big opportunity for learning about what we should eat. There's such a big opportunity for realizing superfoods. And Africa's got lots of superfoods. Medical plus healer minus. You go to the, the doctor, medicine says, 
I must operate. I must fix your leg by operating. I must fix your knee by operating. I must fix your headache by giving you a headache pill. I must fix your depression by giving you a pill. A healer, on the other hand, will take stuff away. So one of the things that healer will tell you to do is fasting. Fasting comes from ancient traditions. There's fasting in Christianity. There's fasting in Judaism. There's fasting in Islam. There's fasting in, in Tibetan Buddhism. There's fasting in every everywhere of life because a fast heals you. When you fast, you take stuff away. You take either water and food away or just food or just water. And you fast. You give yourself, your body time to repair. And then you've got intermittent fasting where you eat. I eat at 11, between 11 and 12 o'clock. I have what I call brunch, breakfast and lunch. And then I have 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the evening. I have lapa, a mixture of lunch and supper. And then I have 18 hours of not eating. I have water in the morning and I have some nut some nutrition, some vitamins, but not food food. Not And I, I, I try to be vegetarian 99% of the time so that my body is not spending time processing meat. I know that as soon as I get sick in any way, I must cut out all meat, all dairy, all bread. I must just allow my body to spend its energy focusing on getting rid of the invader rather than processing food. And then we've got all the brain stuff. Let's move this. this is, if I click on here, move all those at the same time. Brain. Worry. People are worried. Let's just let's see. We've got cancers. We can move that over here. Right. So things are not. I don't like to have overlapping lines. So we've got worry. People are worried. There's so much fake news. Some people's fake news is another person's non-fake news. Something that's good for one person is bad for another person. Saying it's a fact for one person is a is a mystery for another person. Fact and fiction are mixed up. There's so much information coming at us. Big problems in it caused by an inability to make decisions. Let's just say caused by an inability to make decisions in a world of mystery verse puzzle. So in a puzzle, you've got a thousand piece puzzle, a picture of the harbor, a picture of a ship, a picture of a face, whatever it is. And you put all the pieces in and there's one piece missing, you know exactly the piece that's missing. But in a mystery, you've got all the pieces. We've got all the information. We've got access to everything we need right now. We have access to everything we need. And yet we're stuck. We stuck with inflation. We stuck with higher electricity prices. We stuck with, with potential global warming. We stuck with environmental destruction. And yet we have all the information. Everything is available. I mean, you have you have your cell phone. Everything is on your cell phone. Everything's on your computer. We've got Wikipedia. We've got the library. We've got the information. We've got uh, strategy consultancies. We've got all sorts of people giving information for free. We've got YouTube videos. We've got so much happening. The world is flooded with information, but people are unable to sift through this and see what's applicable for them. And so there's worry. And then worry, if worry is compounded with worry, eventually becomes anxiety. I'm anxious. I'm flooding my body with toxins. And depression is part of this whole thing where I'm so stuck in my, in my darkness and I'm trying to be like the Joneses, but I lost all my money. Some people are committing suicide because they lost all their money, but sometimes their family don't care. They live in a big house. Maybe the house is worth a million dollars. They can sell the million dollar house. Maybe they can only get $800,000 for the moment, but so what? They can still get a lot of money. They can move to a tiny little house, $50,000, $100,000 house, have lots of spare change. Can make their own electricity and their own water and their own food, live off grid and have a quiet, independent life. That's why there's the great resignation. So the great resignation means that people are resigning because there's something better, outside work. So for me, one of the things is I've been depressed three times in my life, each time caused by a financial collapse of my business or one of my businesses, and I gave myself a hard time. But I've learned something about depression, and after eight years of a meditation course in the Buddhist center and becoming a Reiki master and studying Kabbalah, and studying ancient wisdom and so all that's all, all is that I can climb down into the cesspit, into the poo, and I can be there in the smelly dark dungeon and try to climb out, and I can't because the walls are thick with all of this muck and I can't get out. Or I can imagine myself I'm in a boat on top of the ocean and the light is shining, it's in the middle of the day, and I see the darkness and I take a, a rod and I wind the rod into the water and I pull up that boot. Or I put up that stale stuff, or I put up that, and I enlighten it. As it comes past the water, it gets enlightened. And so I can deal with the darkness. I can bring the darkness into the light. 
And so health is such a big part of our really big problems that are being caused by such a lot of other stuff that's going on. And we have all these crises all happening at the same time. Our really big problems is crises. I'm going to put that here in capitals. Crises. So many crises. Let's go to the main point and then we'll go to so. So the main point is, you've seen my videos. What is the thing I want right now? Before anything. I want to be alive in three minutes. Then I want to be alive next week. So there's a lot of three minutes. And because I want that, I also want to be able to predict the future. But being wanting to be alive in three minutes with clean air, and then I want to have clean water, and then I want to have clean food, and I want to have means I have to have clean electricity, means I have to have a clean environment, means I have to have clean health. And if I have all that, I can predict the future. People say it's impossible to predict the future, but when you watch this video series, you're going to see that it's very easy to predict the future. Your house is your castle. When your house is your castle, you've paid off your house, you've paid off your cars, you don't even need cars maybe. Paid off your electricity, you've paid off your water, you've paid off your food, you have no cost. Your cost of living must come down every year. And because my three minutes says I want everything to be healthy, it informs my next 100 years. And I say, okay, I need to build my system so that I achieve my three-minute objective. My 100-year system allows me to make my three-minute system a reality. So, what do we need? Well, first thing we need, mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is one-track mind. Mindfulness is where, firstly, when we learn to meditate, we learn to focus on something. Normally, we learn to focus on our breath. Inhalation, exhalation, because we always have our breath. That's one kind of meditation. Another kind of meditation is a, a mantra. We say, in, in Judaism, we say, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Lehenu, Adonai Echad. Some people say, Omani Peme Hung, if they're Buddhists. Or they have different ways of saying different things. So we have all these possibilities, and mindfulness says, I'm mindful of what's happening now. I can't control what happens in my brain. I can only control what I do with what happens in my brain. So I can't control what comes into my head. I can't control the fact that I see a pretty person on the beach wearing a costume. Beautiful. And that attracts me. I can't control that. That's beautiful. That's attraction. But I can control what I do with it. I'm married. I've got a family. I know where my responsibilities are. I see a new cell phone. Wow, great. But it's 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 a thousand dollars. I can't afford that. I look at it, I put it down. I'm mindful of what I'm doing with information coming into my mind. So there's a lot of information comes to my mind. I sift it out. There's some information I don't want to listen to. There's some information I do listen to, but I, I decide is it important or not. And I reduce my worry. I reduce my anxiety. I reduce, reduce my depression. I increase my nutrition. I decrease my misunderstandings. All the stuff I've got in the health section. So things becoming smaller and miniaturization will mean that electricity, water, food, and education will be made and consumed at the point. So in other words, I don't have to go and make electricity a thousand kilometers or a thousand miles from my house. I can make it in my house. I can sell it to my neighbor. My neighbor, maybe I need excess electricity at a particular point. My neighbor can sell that electricity to me. Let's see, I've got something else here. Producers and consumers will become prosumers. So someone's producing, someone's consuming. I become a prosumer where I'm making something. And if I have excess, I can sell it or I can put it in my batteries. We need theme parks to remain. I've got the story about the king and the peasant, another mind map. And if you look at the next one, it says, on my cell phone, which costs, say, $700, the cell phone. Today, there's $900,000 of free apps. And if you want to know about that, Singularity University, Diamandis and Kotler wrote a book called Abundance, and you should read it. And over here, let's see if I can make this bigger. Oh, you, probably, oh, you can't see it. It's not, it's not on the screen, but... In the mind map, you'll see that you'll have the access to the mind map. I'll put a PDF. You can double click on here and this thing gets bigger and then it uh, shows as an image and that shows you 
what's this? I wonder if I can make it big on the screen here. No, I can't. Okay. But the point about it is that it shows you the breakdown of all those things. So, we, you know, in our cell phone, we've got a, a video camera. We've got a normal camera. We can speak. We can see each other. We've got a phone. We've got video conferencing. We've got banking. We've got navigation. We've got weather stations. We've got everything. Whatever you can think of, it's in your phone, on your computer. $900,000 worth. And the presidency of now, we have more in our hand today than the president of the United States had in all the computer systems he had 15 years ago. So in 2022, 15 years ago is 2003. So we, you think what America had 2000, in 2003. Everybody who's got a cell phone has more than that right now. I mean, jobs went, if the corporation spent $45 billion a year sponsoring athletes and sports. Satellite will, dis will disappear, DSTV, as micro-entertainment takes over. So we already see that streaming services, YouTube, and so on. Let's just go back to here. I'll make this a bit smaller so you can see the whole thing. If I zoom out, you can see the whole picture. So there, we've just spent 41 minutes going through this. There's the whole picture. I'll put a link to it on SlideShare so you can download the PDF and look in more detail as it, at it at your leisure. But you'll see that what I'm saying in my presentation and in this talk is that we have a way of solving our problems. We have a way of solving our problems. All these crises that we have, all dependent on an axiom of our system. An axiom, look up A-X-I-O-M. There's an axiom of our system. We need to change the axiom to a new axiom. And I can't decide if I should just give everybody the new axiom for free or if people should pay me for the new axiom. So please let me know. Should I crowdfund it? You know, should I just, what should I do? Should I give it away? If you watch all the videos that I make, even if I don't say what the axioms are, you should get an understanding of what I'm talking about and what we need to do to fix our systems. So I thank you again. I, I'm really enjoying doing these presentations. I'm really enjoying the process. I would love if more people would subscribe to my channel, if more people would like my videos, if more people would share, because then eventually I can monetize my channel and I can start making money from people watching my YouTube videos, and then I can do, do this even more full-time. Do more research, do more R&D, do more proof of concepts, do more public speaking, give more stuff away for free. So it's up to you. If you want more of this and you're enjoying this, then please like and subscribe and share, comment. And you don't need to ring the bell. Don't click on the bell. When you want to see if I've got a video, you'll see a little blue dot or whatever color dot on the side in your list of channels, and you can see who's made a new video. I'm making a video every day at the moment, except on Saturdays, having the day off, but you'll see. So thank you, and good night, or good morning, or good afternoon. And I appreciate you being here, and I like the discussions, and I send blessings and healing to you all.